Hi, and welcome to a Digital Defense, Bloomberg News' cybersecurity show that we do here every week. Uh, as always, this is, a, uh, this is a highly interactive show, at least we aim for it to be, so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to, uh, to write in wherever you're watching the show. Uh, we are streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, as of this week, Periscope. Uh, my name is Jordan Robertson. I'm a cybersecurity reporter for Bloomberg here in Washington, D.C. And this week, I wanted to talk to you about uh, a big investigation that we just published in, uh, in Bloomberg Business Week uh, regarding a computer exploit sale gone horribly wrong in, uh, in Mauritania, in, uh, in West Africa. It's a really interesting tale and a really interesting story that shows kind of the danger of this new form of arms trade. Uh, you know, we tend to think of uh, arms trafficking as the, uh, the physical kind, you know, weaponry. Uh, but there's a new type of arms trade, and that's uh, computer exploits. You know, we've seen some of this with, uh, you know, Edward Snowden's revelations about national security agency spying. Uh, you know, spy agencies for, for many years now have used computer exploits to break into uh, other governments' networks and private companies' networks and things like that. And where our story took us, uh, you know, you can find it uh, actually on my Twitter account. That's at Jordan R1000, at J O R D A N R1000. Uh, the, the story is pinned there. Uh, it's called the Mauritania Exploit. And where our story takes us is, uh, is to two places. Our story takes us to New Delhi, uh, where the story begins in India, uh, and where the story uh, ends is Mauritania in West Africa. And uh, let me show you a couple of pictures here. Uh, that might uh, help illustrate what we're talking about. So I want to introduce you to a couple of people that are instrumental in this story. This is Manish Kumar. He is a 30-year-old uh, Indian uh, computer exploit dealer. Uh, grew up a few hours outside of New Delhi. Uh, this summer I went to visit uh, Manish in New Delhi when he was back home visiting family. Uh, he now lives in Germany. Uh, and this is uh, Manish. This is his brother. Uh, and this is an investor in Manish's company, and, and we're all sitting here uh, in New Delhi. Now, what Manish does is he sells computer exploits to government. Uh, you know, post Edward Snowden, you know, guys like this have really, there have been a lot more people like this cropping up, wanting to get in on this business of selling, you know, hacking tools to governments. Uh, it's pretty hard to sell hacking tools to the U.S. government. Uh, there are lots of defense contractors uh, who have long-standing businesses doing that. However, there are many more governments around the world uh, who don't have those connections and who need guys like this, who they meet at military conferences, uh, surveillance conferences, things like that. And uh, where the story takes us is, uh, you know, in 2014, Manish Kumar is at a, uh, a, a government uh, you know, military uh, sales conference in, uh, in Doha and uh, meets representatives of the Mauritanian government. Now, many people don't know where Mauritania is. Uh, this, this is where Mauritania is, country on, uh, on, on the western coast of, uh, of Africa. Uh, it's a, it's a, a pretty small country. Uh, there are only four million people uh, in Mauritania, and most of them live on the far western uh, side here in the capital called Nakhchat. And uh, that's where Manish found himself after meeting representatives of the Mauritanian uh, presidency, actually, uh, signing a $2.5 million deal uh, to supply computer exploits to the Mauritanian government. Now, this wasn't just any computer exploit, though. This was uh, what they call a silent SMS exploit. And what that means is, you know, a lot of hacking attacks that you can think of, including, like, the attack on the DNC, uh, you know, Russia's uh, attempts to influence, you know, uh, U.S. elections, it, those are all hacks that involve people doing something, people clicking on something that they shouldn't, people entering their, uh, their passwords into uh, you know, bogus sign-in forms for Gmail and things like that. What a silent SMS exploit does is it allows a government or you know, any other attacker who has this capability to send code to any, you know, anybody's mobile phone whose number they have uh, and remotely inject malicious code into those phones, no user interaction required. Um, this is a really big deal, and this was something that Mauritania really wanted, and that Manish and his company, which is called Wolf Intelligence, uh, had, uh, you know, or claimed to have, uh, you know, certainly in its marketing uh, materials and promotional materials. This was uh, this was a capability that Wolf Intelligence touted pretty loudly. Um, you know, now why this is important to uh, you know to, to viewers is this is guys like Manish and guys in companies like Wolf Intelligence, you know, they're, they're going around the world now selling, you know, really sophisticated uh, hacking tools 
uh, to foreign governments, in this case Mauritania. Now Mauritania is a, a, a U.S. ally. We supply them with, uh, with, with arms and training, counterterrorism uh, for counterterrorism operations. However, Mauritania is not a nice country. They have a, a history of human rights abuses, uh, disappearing journalists, disappearing human rights activists, disappearing political opponents. There's a, it's one of the few countries on earth where slavery uh, you know, is still a going concern. Uh, you know, there have been uh, 10 coups or attempted coups since the country uh, you know, gained independence in 1960. So uh, this is a country where in the wrong hands, these hacking tools can do a lot of damage and, and repress free speech and things like that. Um, so the story takes a kind of crazy turn that I will, uh, I will uh, fill you in on after we take some questions here. Uh, but just keep that in mind. Manish Kumar winds up in Mauritania, $2.5 million deal is on the table. It gets signed. Now he's got to deliver this really incredible hacking tool that he's promised them. Uh, I do want, to go to, uh, do want to go to some of these questions first, and we'll get back to the story. The question that came in is, has the Trump administration expressed any thoughts on forming an international cyber warfare framework? Um, if I'm understanding the question you know, correctly, uh, you know, Trump has been pretty, pretty uh, opaque about his, his views on cyber warfare and, and the use of cyber weapons like the kind uh, that uh, Wolf Intelligence was selling in, in Africa. Uh, you know, he, there is this idea that he's going to issue, uh, you know, uh, he's going to direct federal agencies to look for vulnerabilities in their networks and try to do more on the defensive side. But, uh, you know, in, in answering this question, I think we can take a cue from, you know, his general stance, uh, you know, toward military matters, which is that he's pretty hawkish on using the military uh, as an expression of U.S. Uh, US strength abroad. Uh, and that does include now, uh, you know, a really vast and sophisticated, uh, you know, cyber arsenal. Uh, and these are, you know, these can be covert actions for spying or, you know, secretly damaging equipment, uh, you know, inside en enemy networks, or they can be more overt, which is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing damage to enemy networks in a way that very clearly says, we're the U.S., don't mess with us, uh, look what we just did to your systems. Uh, you know, that's uh, what, what a lot of experts worry about, though, in that, in that space is, uh, you know, escalating responses. So, uh, no, Trump hasn't said anything specific about, you know, any, any international cyber warfare uh, frameworks, but this is a question that uh, presidents increasingly have to grapple with, uh, you know, as our cyber uh, arsenal expands. Uh, next question here is, you know, how do you think Trump would have reacted to Edward Snowden and the NSA leaks? Well, this is an interesting question because, you know, uh, Trump's stance on uh, this space has changed over time. Uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you recall the early days of the election uh, and the campaign, you know, WikiLeaks and guys like Edward Snowden, uh, people like uh, Chelsea Manning, who uh, President Obama uh, pardoned, uh, you know, these were traitors to the country. And, and many people believe that, uh, you know, especially in government, especially in, in intelligence circles. Uh, you know, that position may have shifted a little bit. Uh, toward the end of the, uh, the election when WikiLeaks was publishing information that was damaging to his opponent. Uh, and he became a proponent of, <laughs> of WikiLeaks and, uh, you know, this idea that hacked information could be useful. So, you know, how would, how would Trump have reacted to Edward Snowden if it happened, uh, you know, on his watch? I imagine he would have been pretty hawkish, uh, you know, about, uh, about hunting Edward Snowden down and trying to penalize him you know, if that information was, uh, you know, either embarrassing or damaging to his administration in any way, I think WikiLeaks was a special case where it involved a distinct political advantage. And, uh, you know, thus it was to his benefit to, um, you know, to kind of uh, warm to this idea that, you know, sites like WikiLeaks that, that leak hacked information could be useful. Uh, I don't think that's his position now on Snowden, but we'll see. Um, so I want to take you back to, again to this story. So where, where I left off, and again, for those of you just joining us, uh, this is a, you know, a, a big investigation that Bloomberg Business Week just put out uh, that we worked on for, for a number of months. Uh, you can find the link on my Twitter page, which is at JordanR1000, J-O-R-D-A-N-R-1000. Uh, uh, the link is, uh, is pinned there to this story. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, the story is called The Mauritania Exploit. And where we left off was Manish Kumar and his, uh, his company, Wolf Intelligence, uh, was in Mauritania, uh, a country on the, uh, the, the western coast of, uh, of Africa. Uh, had just signed a $2.5 million deal to um, supply them with a very advanced form of hacking tool called a silent SMS exploit. Uh, I don't want to spoil all the surprises for you in the story. We think it's, it's quite a revealing and uh, engaging tale. Uh, but what I'll tell you very simply is Manish didn't have the exploit. 
He just, you know, got signed a $2.5 million contract uh, for an exploit that is very valuable, that many, many government agencies would love to have. He didn't have it. He knew who had it, but he'd have to pay that person a million dollars. Uh, I'll shorten the story here for you, but basically the way this deal worked was uh, he was paid $500,000 upfront, uh, you know, to begin the process of installing the software. The problem was he needed a million to go pay an Israeli named Duty Sternberg for this computer exploit uh, that the Mauritanian government wanted. You know, a series of, you know, really disastrous things happened uh, subsequent to that. Uh, long story short, you know, Manish flies to Tel Aviv twice, tries to negotiate for this, uh, this exploit with uh, this Israeli exploit dealer, doesn't get it, and where we're left is the Mauritanian government demanded that uh, Wolf Intelligence place a person in Mauritania always until this deal was done. If they expected any more money, uh, and by that point Manish had been paid 1.5 million, but there was a dispute with his uh, distributor over how much he had. Point was he never had the million dollars, never had the exploit, and the Mauritanian government said, if you want the rest of the money on this contract, you need to leave a person in Mauritania always as human collateral <laughs> for this deal, which is behavior we see out of like drug kingpins. Uh, and I want to introduce you to the person who was that human collateral and in fact is still there in Mauritania has been arrested uh, it's been over a year and a half he's been detained uh, you know inside a Mauritanian uh, government military barracks uh, you know as again collateral for this deal that has not been resolved he's been brought up on fraud charges he's been brought up on money laundering charges you know a whole host of charges that uh, this is an Italian citizen named Christian Provisionato uh, and the core of this story, which, as I say, is on my, my Twitter account, uh, you know, is, uh, is that this person is still there. The deal went so badly that there's uh, somebody in, inside Mauritania now who's being held hostage, uh, and there's really no clear sense of when he'll get out. I wanted to, uh, to break away from the story to answer a few more questions here uh, from, uh, from the audience. Thank you for sending these in. Who leads the world in cybersecurity? Is it the U.S.? Uh, the general view is that the U.S. does lead the world in terms of offensive cybersecurity. Uh, you know, the U.S. government doesn't have to deal with dealers like Manish Kumar. The U.S. government has computer exploits created for it, uh, you know, by companies like Raytheon and Northrop Grumman. Obviously, a lot of this stuff is built in-house at the NSA, uh, the CIA as well. Uh, so we have a lot of capabilities in that regard. However, you know, you talk to any intelligence folks and they'll tell you uh, you know, Russia is very, very good. Russia is considered our peer in cyberspace in terms of their hacking capabilities. Uh, China is very good as well. Uh, uh, North Korea actually has a lot of capabilities uh, that's uh, by extension from Russia. There's a lot of uh, collaboration between Russia, China, and North Korea, um, and Iran as well. I mean, certainly Israel, uh, you know, is a, is a top contender there as well. Uh, so the U.S. technically may lead in terms of dollars spent and overall capabilities, uh, but those countries are not far behind. Uh, another question here is, what are the immediate signs when using a smartphone that, that's been tampered with or hacked? Okay, I like this question because it is a very pra there's a practical answer to that question. Watch your data usage. Watch your data usage and your text message usage on your bills. So one of the things that hackers can do is when they get inside your device is they can erase all visible signs that they were there. So it's not like you'll open up your email and it'll say, oh, two of you are logged in at the same time. Uh, you know, your phone must be hacked. I mean, that happens sometimes, but, but skilled hackers will know, uh, you know, to, to not let that happen. So one of the ways to tell if your phone has been hacked is to look at things like, um, you know, data charges or any unnecessary or unexpected uh, charges on your bill. Because the fact of the matter is, if a government agency is trying to hack your phone, the consensus view is they're going to be able to do it and you're not going to know. So you kind of have to take that off the table. If you are a target of government surveillance, it's very, very hard to defend against that. Uh, there are certain ways to do that that we can touch on in a future episode. But uh, you know, in, for, for the average person, the best way to tell if you've been hacked is to look at your phone bill. Because a lot of mobile phone hackers, what they're after are access to your text messages so that they can subscribe you to premium text messaging services that they then reroute to phones under their control, but you are billed for them and they collect the money. This is a classic scam, it just happens to be on mobile phones, uh, but you'll see that on your phone bill. So don't just, don't just throw the phone bill away if the amount is kind of generally in the range of what you expect. Look for any unexpected charges because that's why people hack mobile phones these days. Um, next question is, what are your thoughts on Rudy Giuliani's role with cybersecurity? 
you know, Giuliani's, uh, you know, appointment by President Trump uh, to lead, uh, you know, cybersecurity, uh, you know, for, for the U.S. government uh, caught a lot of people by surprise because he doesn't have any expertise in it. Uh, you know, certainly there are lots of members of government uh, and this administration, uh, you know, that don't have experience, relevant experience in, uh, you know, the areas they've been, uh, you know, they've been named to. However, the, the appointment of Giuliani was very surprising to a lot of people because, you know, cybersecurity is more than just, uh, you know, like other areas of technology where it's just selling boxes or selling software and it's very transactional. You know, it's a very active, dynamic space where, uh, you know, it's hard, it's, it's hard even for the most advanced uh, practitioners to stay current. So, you know, if you're not technical, uh, you know, in this area, uh, you know, just being somebody kind of with a title may not be all that helpful because you really have to be uh, familiar with the state of the art if you hope to be, uh, you know, good at advising the president, you know, either on offense, uh, you know, or on defense and protecting government networks, uh, you know, it's, it's a big job. So you, you kind of have to be uh, familiar with the state of the art. And again, that's hard even for the most advanced practitioners to keep up with. Um, next question here is Trump's tweets have the power to move markets. Do you know what kind of security he uses on his Twitter account, two-factor authentication? You know, I was actually thinking about this just today because there have been a number of reports that, that President Trump refuses to give up his, uh, his old smartphone that he's been using, some kind of Samsung device, uh, where he uses Twitter. You know, we don't know if it's through an app or just through the web interface, but, you know, it's fair, probably fair to assume it's the app just because it's easier. Uh, you know, and Twitter has some security mechanisms like two-factor authentication, which I recommend everybody use if you're worried about uh, security of your email accounts or smartphone accounts. Always use two-factor authentication because those are text messages you get sent to your phone uh, that tell you, uh, you know, when you're logging in, you've got to enter the special code. Now, that's great, a great tool for me and you. Uh, you know, if you're the president of the United States, that phone is going to be the target of the most advanced attacks on the planet. And there, there are actually pretty easy ways to get around things like two-factor authentication. Uh, you know, one of them that's been demonstrated is calling up your phone company, pretending, you're you, pretending they're you, uh, and getting your code sent to a different phone number. So you could have two-factor authentication turned on, but if your phone provider, Verizon, AT&T, whoever, is tricked into sending those alerts to a different number, which is social engineering, it's just somebody calling up and getting lucky that uh, the person on the other end of the line is willing to make that change for you. Uh, this has happened to Black Lives Matter uh, activists, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's not a terribly difficult thing to do. So in terms of security, uh, it's generally seen within the security community that he's making, he's taking a huge risk by keeping his old phone and using it to, uh, to, to tweet out because as, the, um, as the, uh, the viewer points out, you know, he has the power to not only move markets with his tweets, uh, you know, but also to start wars. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh, there, there, there are a whole host of things that, that Donald Trump can do with his Twitter account uh, that make it, you know, maybe the most powerful Twitter account uh, in the world. Not maybe, I mean, most likely uh, the most powerful Twitter account in the world. And to hackers, uh, there's enormous advantage uh, in that. And there could be enormous advantage in, in simply spying on what he's typing. You know, if you know what Donald Trump is going to tweet, you know, even two seconds before it actually posts because it's being, because you're spying on his keystrokes on his phone, that can have enormous advantages for people looking to trade on stocks, uh, you know, or nation states uh, trying to get uh, any edge in learning what the president of the United States is thinking. So it's a huge disadvantage for him to keep that phone from a security uh, perspective. Uh, we're getting some great questions today. Thank you uh, for all of you writing in. Uh, what will it look like if someone steals my information via my Wi-Fi connection at home? Um, Wi-Fi is tricky because, uh, you know, often they're public Wi-Fi settings. I'm not sure if this reader, this viewer is referring to a public or a private Wi-Fi, uh, you know, uh, network. Uh, the problem with Wi-Fi is you, there are tools to scan for, uh, you know, uh, individuals who are sitting on your network capturing traffic. It takes some technical expertise to do that. So in general, what I advise people to do is, you know, the easiest thing for a consumer to do is to look at which web pages you're using. And if you're using web pages that have HTTPS in the address bar, uh, and in some browsers it's characterized by a green padlock or the entire address bar will be green, uh, you know, that means that any information you send from your browser uh, to the website is encrypted in transit. Now, it doesn't mean it's hack-proof. 
if somebody's sitting on your computer or sitting on the server uh, you know, of the website you're interacting with, they can capture that information. But that is the most surefire way to protect your information on Wi-Fi uh, networks, including public Wi-Fi. I mean, public Wi-Fi is not the safest thing in the world. However, it has gotten safer to use in recent years because many, many websites, you know, Google and, and Yahoo and you know, all, the major, all the major banks use encryption on their web pages. Uh, that means if, even if you are interacting with that bank on a hacked Wi-Fi internet, uh, they can't see what you're sending. So that's, that's, that's actually the, the, the easiest way uh, to, uh, to protect your information uh, you know, on Wi-Fi uh, networks. There is one catch, I'll say, uh, and I've talked to some technical, technical experts about this. Information you're entering on those pages will be encrypted, uh, usernames, passwords, things like that, but pages you're visiting will not be. So if you are, and this is really important to note, if you're searching for uh, you know, sensitive content in uh, a country where the internet is monitored. And if you Google uh, you know, keywords and Google will take you to those pages, the keywords you enter into Google, those will be protected, but the page that you visit will not be. So somebody monitoring that traffic will see what you're searching for, even if those connections are secured. So that's a really important point and one that uh, is worth remembering if uh, your traffic is being monitored. Um, last question here, and then we're gonna wrap up uh, for this week, is hacking private companies part of this cyber warfare? For example, Sony hacks or the Xbox hacks. Uh, well, two, two questions really in there. The, the Sony hack uh, you know, uh, was attributed by the US government back to North Korea. Uh, so we will take that at face value. Uh, some security experts uh, you know, challenged that attribution. They said there wasn't enough information, but let's just assume that that information is accurate. Uh, you know, the hack of a private company, if it aligns with a nation state interest, is, uh, is, is something that actually happens all the time. You know, Sony was a watershed in that we saw the information get leaked and we saw real economic damage to the company uh, because of that. And we've talked to government experts who said that it, it really provoked a round of discussions within the intelligence community in the U.S. about how do we classify these companies because nobody in the government had ever thought to classify a company like Sony uh, you know, as a crit piece of critical infrastructure for the U.S. It's an entertainment company. They make movies and TV shows. They're not a, a power utility. They're not a water utility. They're not a bank. Um, but increasingly, the government is, is being forced to reconsider some of those ideas because, you know, if you're able to cause significant economic harm to a major, uh, you know, uh, U.S. corporation, uh, that is a matter of national security. Uh, and that is of interest to certain nation states. You know, banks are clearly, you know, uh, very high on the list because if you take down a bank or you, you take down their money moving systems, even for a short period of time, you know, you're talking about economic uh, disruption of kind of the highest magnitude. Um, so with that, we're going to wrap up here. Again, I want to put in one more plug for our story, uh, the Mauritania exploit. Again, you can see it on my, uh, my Twitter account, at JordanR1000. Uh, it's a great read. Uh, I won't spoil the ending for you, but uh, you know, there's more to the story than we've, um, than we've outlined here. And uh, as always, thank you to everybody who wrote in with questions. Uh, we always uh, appreciate getting them. Please feel free to message me offline as well, and we'll try to get to any questions that come in that way uh, next week. Uh, so with that, we'll sign off here. Thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week on Digital Defense.